So that leads me to my prediction, which is that I don't have any major reasons to say, okay, but remember this, we talked about that. So instead of thinking we might win or lose this game, I'm going to now say, okay, we can, we can you know, do the opposite of that because of this uncommon situation that was going on. It looks like we're going to have the guys we thought we were going to have. So we're going to make our prediction based off of um, our normal depth chart, what we thought was going to take place. Okay. So we will try and get into um, some of the, the, the specifics, but not bog down in it so much because this is going to be an overall general prediction and things are going to change throughout the season. So we're not going to try and take every little thing into account, but we want to give enough so that it makes sense. Okay. Before we do that though, let's spice it up a little bit. Okay. What I have seen is that, and it's been said, Olin Buchanan asked this uh, of Jimbo in the press conference, and that people are saying that we're an eight and four team. We're an eight and four team. Even Vegas is saying it, really, because the uh, over under for regular season wins is 8.5. So are you going to bet the under that we're going to win eight or less games, or are you going to bet the over that we're going to win nine or more games? And people are thinking that we're an eight and four team. Makes sense. We won eight and four last year. People have even said this last August 4th was Texas A&M day for going eight and four. I'd rather that than it be uh, May 7th though, wouldn't you? Of course it would. So we'll just leave that right there. However, I guess based off of history, eight and four is fine. That's not where we think we're headed though. We're trying to do something different. Now, look at the juice though. The juice is at minus 140. So that means you've got to bet $140 to win $100. Um, so instead of the juice being $110, which is, you know, you're going to have to pay $10 to make a bet, essentially is what that means. No, no, no. You've got to pay $40 to make that bet. And now it's getting some people thinking. So why would the juice go all the way up to there? Well, it seems like it probably started at $110, and people have been betting the over, so they're making that bet more expensive. You can't win as much if you bet over eight and a half wins, meaning that you think we're going to win 9, 10, 11, 12 in the regular season. So you're going to have to pay more if you want that bet because people are thinking that's, that's what it's going to be based off of the juice. Okay, so you got to, whatever you bet, you're only going to win 70% of that instead of, only, uh, instead of being able to win 95% of that. You see? You see the difference? So it seems like and you know what Vegas wants to do normally is they want to have that line right in the middle so they got about 50% of the bets on one side, 50% on the, on the other, so they're guaranteed the juice from everybody. Or if they can get lucky, they'll get everybody to bet on the wrong side and then they'll clean up. All right, well, general consensus right now is that we're going to win more than eight and a half based off of where the betting is at this point. So do I think that? Let's find out. Let's find out. So let's start. What's our first game? Sam Houston State. Right. 11 a.m. Uh, what? September 3rd. Right. Have you, have you started hydrating yet? Start. Get it. Let's get on with it. And then it's going to be Appalachian State, right? So these two games, W's, that's, who's, who's predicting an L? Don't predict an L. Uh, you might get run out of town. But let's talk about why you need to watch these games, okay? And I've said it multiple times. I'm a big proponent of watching these games all the way through, all the way through, end of the fourth quarter. Uh, I will stay maybe in Kyle Field until the um, post-game press conference comes out, and then from there I may even go. But I'm going to see I'm going to see every string play as I can. Why? Because first off, and let's talk about the Kent State game from last year. Did you know that with four minutes left in the third quarter? We had scored one offensive touchdown. One offensive touchdown. I went back and looked to kind of see, and there were a couple interceptions right from Haynes King. I think one of them was specifically Demas's fault. Uh, however, that ball was thrown just a little bit behind. You know, Demas caught it, tried to catch it kind of like this, hit, hit on his arm. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna still put this on Demas at the time because you need to be with your hands. You try and catch with your arm or your chest, you're just asking for it. So even though it was behind him, should have been like that, but that, that, that's in the past. The others, um, we had a couple of forces by King um, and, and, and some more inerrancy going on. Okay, all right, fine. 
But I just want to point out then, because we wanted to check back on that, some people were thinking, well, maybe it wasn't that big a deal. And to a degree it wasn't, okay? Haynes King actually did set a record, we're going to talk more about that later, in that game. But the, the struggle was there. As, as mentioned, we had scored one offensive touchdown with four minutes left in the, in the third quarter. We had uh, two field goals, and then we had a pick six from Leon O'Neill. So that's not the kind of game I'm looking for when we play Sam Houston State or Appalachian State this year. I wasn't looking for that last year either, and that threw up red flags for me. Watching that game and then seeing how the rest of the season played out with eight and four makes a lot of sense to me. Does it, does it make sense to you? I mean, who wants to really can say, well, we said that and that's the way it worked out. I, I think that that plays out a lot of times. I, we need to dominate Sam Houston State. Did we dominate Kent State? I didn't think we did. And we end up losing to Mississippi State. Um, you know, the Arkansas game, Ole Miss, and then LSU. When we had, we were right there looking at nine wins. And we just didn't, we, we, we let that pass get down there. We were, the LSU game was just too close. We need we need more more space. So I'm going to watch these games really really closely. Um, I want to see how labored it looks. Um, I want to see when do our starters come out? Are they coming out in the fourth quarter? Or are they coming out uh, after a series in the third? What's the score at halftime? I think the score was 10-3 at the end of Kent State. Is that right? 10 to three? Hmm. So look at these games. I think they're going to tell you a lot. If nothing more, think about it this way. When the second and third string come in, how are they doing against Sam Houston State? And why does that matter? For me, it matters because if those guys are putting it on Sam Houston State and App State, then that tells me that's who, that, that should, it gives me a picture of who has been pushing the ones. Have the ones been going up against fluff in practice? Um, or have they been going up guys who are pushing them, right? Um, Jimbo Fisher says that, that competition basically stomps out complacency. So I want to see what the level of competition is uh, that's, that's behind our number ones. and Because that gives me a pretty good idea. Not that it was like that last year. I think we had other things going on last year. Uh, we can talk about those. But you can think about the, the Sumlin era. Uh, there was a couple games that, you know, I think we might have even been up behind at halftime. That's unacceptable, especially in these games. My goodness. So that's what I'm going to be watching. Do I think these are going to be big wins? Yes. I'm hoping. I'm looking. I don't want to see, oh, my, my goodness, um, no more than a touchdown by the other team at halftime. No more than 10 points for the game, for sure. Uh, I'd be much more satisfied with... Um, you know, a field goal only. And then I'm starting to look at like, okay, how many times did they cross uh, midfield? And uh, how many first downs did they get? Um, I'm gonna be looking at those kinds of things closely after the game, okay? So very, very interesting things to think about whenever we are taking into consideration uh, these first two games. So they are cupcake games, but there's more to see than, than what we, we generally think. Getting on to the next two, we've got Miami coming up right after that, and then Arkansas, then Mississippi State, and followed up by Bama the first half of the season. So I think, I think that our season is big time contingent upon Miami and Arkansas. Miami and Arkansas, okay? So um, you got Mario Cristobal over at Miami taking over the reins there, um, and you've got uh, Pittman over at Arkansas. Arkansas beats us for the first time last year in I think ten years, so they're like they're like one for for ten, and we had like nine in a row. So these are these are concerns because both of these teams uh, have a bit more seniority on the team. So let's start off with Miami, okay? So um, recruiting classes going back four years. Uh, and to the most recent, 17, 11, 11, and 13 were their recruiting classes. Okay, not bad. Um, 
we that 17 I believe was in 2019 and so that was one year after Jimbo Jimbo's first year in I think was right right there 16 17 somewhere in those so it's not unheard of we have that as well the 11 the 11 I think we went like three four and eight after uh, Jimbo's first three years and the number one of course last year so the talent level there's a there's a bit of a gap there but I'm a firm firm believer that once you get a guy into the third and particularly their fourth year so maybe a redshirt junior or senior that you could easily count on a three-star being a four-star I don't think that necessarily applies that you just get an extra star for having been here and been around for that that many years but I think I think it's a pretty good rule of thumb from three to four um, I don't think it really goes from four to five okay so they are um, quite um, experienced along a lot of their um, in, in their position groups now at QB they do have a guy Van Dyke uh, he was the offensive rookie of the year last year I believe so or freshman rookie of the year something like, along those lines he was good last year he's a solid guy that's a name you want to know okay so he is going to be um, uh, being coached up they're going to be running um, by their offensive coordinator Gaddis he has been taken over from Michigan last year very capable guy he's of course he's in his first year with Miami as well just like Kevin still is on defense uh, along with you know Cristobal so Van Dyke at QB he likes the they like to throw downfield and that's that's probably one of his uh, main interests that he's got and they've got a couple of weapons to do it as well so they've got uh, Restrepo at wide receiver and then they've got uh, Knight at running back a bit a bit more of a bruiser type of back and they do have a scat back type as well so Gaddis is kind of their main guy as you want to know and he um, He's a guy that's not really, I would say, he's not committed to necessarily just one system. He's more of a matchup type of guy. And he might have his scheme, but he's not in his scheme for the sake of being in his scheme. He runs his scheme because he likes to get the matchups where he wants to get the matchups. He likes to get a lot of the matchups uh, between wide receiver and linebacker as well as uh, running back to linebacker so his I don't know I don't know famous saying is speed and space and so what he's trying to do is he's going to try and match up a running back particularly a well uh, a running back that runs routes well and get them on a linebacker so that he can get them in space he's going to do the same thing um, with his wide receivers and he's going to work them in ways that's going to get a matchup where he can get them the ball and let their speed work that's what he wants to do okay so I mean doesn't it sound like the spread in one way shape or another um, it does to me I, I don't really know how else to see it but um, that's what they're going to try and do now they average a junior across the offensive line Right, and we're going to be averaging somewhere in the sophomore range across ours. We've got, I believe, Layton is a junior, Fathery going to be a sophomore, Foster a sophomore, Moko I think technically a sophomore too. Zune I believe got maybe the medical red shirt last year, and so if that is where our line plays out, uh, and Zune's a freshman, then we're we're averaging a sophomore. They're averaging a whole another year of experience on us. So, whereas they may not have the same talent we've got on there maybe it maybe it kind of works itself out a little bit so keep your eye on that now on defense uh, Kevin Steele they've been I don't know it doesn't really matter you've got the differences between four three five and there's people who say the same thing about Dirk and uh, whether or not he was a <clears throat> whether or not he was a three three kind of guy or if he's a four two uh, five or you know four three four with that what that's going to be so he um, he's a four-two-five guy, which just means what they're going to be doing is they're going to have four down linemen most of the time, and they're going to run two linebackers. They're going to have a third linebacker, but it, they're going to play a lot of nickel, which really means they're, they're going to have a, a bit of one of their larger Q, uh, excuse me larger DBs, and he's going to be kind of the rover. He's going to be the 
the do it all. He's there. You know, it'll be their equivalent of our Antonio Johnson. So he'll um, he'll be playing up on the line sometimes. He'll be going back into coverage sometimes. You want guys got a little bit more size to him, so he can you can make some of those tackles up front. And that's what they're that's what they're going to do. I have heard it said that uh, their insider from Miami thinks that their defensive line is somewhere along the C plus range. So that's that's something interesting. Um, we're going to have a pretty talented offensive line. That may be a quite quite a nice matchup for us to hone in on. Um, they did really well in the transfer portal, though, so things could shape up a little bit differently than than what they're projected to do. We didn't we weren't big in the transfer portal. Arkansas has been big. Miami's been big. So these are going to be two teams in particular that, depending on how they they uh, work out with their transfers can depend on upon what their success is going to be like. And that's the way Arkansas operated last year. So they've got a lot riding on that. My thought at this point is, and, and where my confidence is, is in our offense this year. I think our offensive line is going to be really solid and legit. I think we're going to be able to score quite a few points on this one. I think our defensive line is just going to be really underrated to start off with. I think that's part of the prediction where we're at with 8-4. and four. I think it's based off of history, not what we can do with the talent that we can do. How do you project wins when you've only got like 60% of your production coming back? Okay, well, um, you know, 60% of your production is pretty close to 8-4. and four. I mean, technically it's 75%, but you get the idea, right? So... Um, that's where it's eight and five. So people may be thinking we should be a nine and three team. That would be seventy-five of the percent of the production coming back. I think that has a lot to do with it. I think our offense is going to be so good uh, when it comes to being able to run the ball and throw it down the field. It's going to be we're going to be able to put up some points on Miami. So I've got this down as a W, um, which is really good news in my mind. I went back and forth, back and forth. I'm like okay, they've got some some experience, um, but they do have a new coach. But that doesn't mean that they're going to, you know, flop the first year. So, can they beat us? Yeah, they can. I'd put this one at um, 60-40. If you're looking at an ESPN matchup predictor, that's probably where I would set this at the at, at the moment. So, we'll revisit it after I see the first two games, and I might have a little bit stronger prediction. I might have a weaker one. I don't know. We'll see. So, three and zero to start off. Arkansas. Arkansas and Mississippi State kind of go um, kind of hand in hand. They're running different offenses, but the defense looks very similar. A lot of three down linemen, and these defenses for both these teams um, really work off of the linebacker. Linebacker is a big deal for them. So they are reading right off the bat. So they can go from having um, six plus in the, in the box to dropping nine in the blink of an eye, okay? Because they've got those three linebackers right there that are ready to, to pounce, but they can also um, they can also drop back into coverage very, very quickly. And that's, that's kind of the strength of, their, of their, their scheme. The problem with their scheme is, is that if you make the wrong read, then you're in a world of hurt and you've got mismatches. And they're going to try and do that. So that'll be also what they're going to try and do along the defensive line. Because you're not going to go three on five. I mean, not usually. You wouldn't expect that's going to work. Worked out for Arkansas last year even then, which is why we had so, many, so much trouble in the first half. But they're going to be a lot of slanting, um, you know, trying to create imbalance in, in that way and get pressure that way. And then they'll have their, their linebackers fill in the gaps um, as needed but they're going to be doing a lot of reads. A lot of what they were able to do successfully in their spring game was when they um, RPO'd it. And so that's something that will help keep those linebackers um, honest and possibly get them to make a wrong read. And when they made a wrong read, you had somebody wide open down the field because you're reading run, you come up, you've got to make a quick adjustment on a receiver um, who's acting like they're getting ready to block or a tight end, and then's going out for a route. If you don't have a quick linebacker, how are they going to catch up? It's not a DB, okay? But that's what they're doing. So I don't think Arkansas is going to 
sort of sneak us on that again. I think our offensive line is going to be much more solidified and upgraded this year. That that's, that, that um, off defensive line rush is not going to have the same impact it did last year. I also think that one way or another, we're going to have a quarterback that's going to help us to kind of balance this, uh, who can get outside the pocket and who can run. Calzada was just awkward in the pocket last year. And that was something that they didn't really have to think about. They weren't really worried about him running, right? And how could we run him much? Uh, who was going to play if he got banged up? We were in a, we were in a spot last year with that. So um, we can really utilize the, the QB this next year when it, when it comes down to, to that. And this is the same thing almost exactly that happened with Mississippi State. Um, make it worse, we're trying to run uh, a three-down defensive lineman situation. I just don't think we were quite prepared for that and knew what we were trying to do. Um, we had some success against Mississippi State whenever we were really hitting the edges hard because when Clemens came in off the edge, and um, it was it was really just too much for them to, to kind of, you know to handle off the edge. And I think we're going to have a lot of that more this year. We're going to get spread out, so I don't know. We can we can we can roll into that defense if we need to. I mean that's part of Durkin's ability. Will we want to do it? I'm not I'm not sure. We're also going to be probably more equipped offensively again to score more points. Now Arkansas has got uh, Jefferson coming back, big QB. Uh, they, they've got Catalan coming back, uh, a very experienced DB. I think he was out about half the season. Pretty sure he was there when we played him. I could be mistaken on that. He might have come back a little bit later. I'm trying to think, who else have they gotten back? Um, uh, I believe Trey Williams is gone, which was the left edge rusher that gave us so many fits. But his counterpart on the other side, I believe Nick Williams, is coming back. You got Bumper Pool coming back, uh, a senior man. It's like, how long is this? Does he play for BYU or something? This guy seems like he's so old, um, and he's got another year of eligibility, so he's coming back. They've got uh, quality running back, and again, they're they're experienced through the offensive line. I think whenever I looked at it, I think they were really close to averaging seniors across the offensive line. Uh, throw in some heavy sets with um, you know an extra lineman tied in and we're looking at a very very physical game again they play us tough every year i think the difference this year is going to be our ability to um uh, get get through that defense a little better you remember how things kind of tightened up on johnny uh, after his first year kind of got you know a little sniff of him and then you know they were going to kind of shut him down they did much better keeping him in the pocket the second year round although he was trying to be a little bit more of a pocket passer to up his draft stock, but you, you get the idea. What, they, what they've what they now been able to see on film, they know what to expect from him. And we've got that now from Arkansas better. And we've got that now from Mississippi State better. And our offense is looking to make moves. One thing I didn't mention that did come out of the press conference, which people have noticed through, through camp, but there's been some personnel change. And I think that, uh, make, you know, double check me on the names. Uh, Damian Craig has moved over to coaching quarterbacks from, from wide receivers, and this has been an area that we had been critical of. And I think um, Cooley moved over to wide receivers, and then, and then Dickey is with the tight ends, although he's offensive coordinator. A little odd for him to work with the tight ends, but they've all, they've all done this. This is what Jimbo talked about. They've all done this. And so we're looking at maybe maybe checking the status quo a little bit, you know, it's easy to get complacent or thinking, you know, you're getting uh, taught in, in one, one form or another, and some shakeup might be good for our receivers, quarterbacks, and tight ends to learn from. So um, I think our offense is where our strength's going to be this year, which is it's a good problem to have. And so I think that's what gets us through our Arkansas. Um, I think we're going to score more points. I think what we end up with ten last year, and I think I think we're going to double that or triple that this year, based off of our offense. Uh, they don't have Traylon Burks anymore for Arkansas, which I think made up at least sixty percent of their receiving yards last year, and like a couple touchdowns on us. Um, they got passed on 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 Jalen. 
who are they going to do to replace him? Now they can replace him. There, there are there are dudes there. It's but you're talking about some you know people that got to step up to that level. Not that it's not possible, but it's a factor in, and that that's not a type of guy that you just replace very easily. We did not. When did we replace Evans? Do you remember? I'm still waiting. Maybe <laughs> we didn't replace Evans. So uh, Mike was a beast, and and that that type of guy, those those you know generational players or era players are not guys that you just you know oh this account for and say so and so is just going to step right up and do that that doesn't happen like that it's possible but not not likely so for what i'm seeing out of arkansas and mississippi state i'd i'd go with right now um wins for both the only loss for arkansas is that we're playing at cowboy stadium we need to start playing this home and home. So just say my little piece on that real quick. But I think we come away with a W on this one this year. I really do. I think our defense will be surprisingly good despite all the changes. You've heard me talk about the, the, the secondary. You know what's getting ready to happen with the, with the defensive line, even though it looks like we replaced it. But our offensive line should be solidified. Uh, we should have a solid quarterback one way or another. And our wide receiver room has been upgraded. I know we haven't talked about the tight ends yet, but there's a big battle there, and it looks like the Swede wants to play. There's a bunch of guys that want to play, I'm sure, and there's a there's going to be a knockdown drag out of there, so we're, it's a little too early. We have, that's why we haven't talked about it a whole bunch. Chain's going to be solid. Amari Daniel's going to be solid. Whoever else needs to come up, crown over, whatever. Why, uh, uh, running back, going to get the job done. So I think our, our, our offense will be a strength this year, unlike what we thought about it last year. And I think that's going to get us through Arkansas and Mississippi State. We're going to have to have defensive stops as well. Defense is probably going to make this game either a one-possession game um, or you know even a field goal kind of situation where it's that close, but we're maybe still ahead uh, that late. But uh, either that or possibly two touchdown scores. I really think that that's a possibility for us in these games this year, um, depending on um, how well that defense is going to end up playing. I think we'll put up the points to be able to do it. We do go to Mississippi State this year, and actually ESPN has them slightly favored in their matchup predictor, which is odd. But I think the keys to beating them is just going to be, again, having a mobile QB, something we didn't have last year, um, putting up a better pass rush. We only had three going most of the time. I mean, um, and then we need to be able to read the blitz. One thing that we don't, well, we didn't talk about a, a lot with Isaiah Spiller, is that he was really good at reading the blitz and where it was coming from, outside, inside, and he he put a helmet on it each time. He wasn't shy. They're going to do a lot of that, the same as Arkansas does, and they're going to send guys uh, left. They're going to send them right. They're going to try and create uh, uh, imbalance. They're going to send their linebackers. Um, through different holes and they're going to just try and come from all different areas to try and either get uh, two linemen blocking the same guy and letting one run free and then that guy maybe runs up the middle between the center and left guard and then the running back thinks that the pressure's coming from outside so he steps over and then you got a guy running free right up the middle. That's the kind of stuff that they're trying to do. So reading that blitz is going to be huge so we can get the uh, the time to pass. When we had the time to pass, we did pretty well against them. We just need the time. They were really good at reading the run as well, so when we did that, you know, we, we didn't see as much success as we had the previous year. So that's my key to to, to both of those games, essentially. And I think it's going to happen. I'm not, I'm not going to shy away from this thinking that a two-touchdown score against these guys is what can can very likely take place. So through five games... Leading up to Bama, I got us five and zero. Oh. Okay, so we're five uh, through eight, and if we want to be over, we need to get to nine. So we need four more wins. So we'll, we're going to see if that that's going to be the case. Now Bama's coming up. We're playing them in Tuscaloosa, right? So what is that going to entail? Now one last year, and if I asked you who is the best team at getting revenge wins, who would you say? I don't think I'd say anybody other than Bama. Thinking about that year after we beat them with Johnny, man, we had to 
thinking about the effort that we gave in that game to keep it where we did was something else. And was it either the following year after Johnny left or even 2015, we just got routed. Ooh, not good. And they probably were looking to take that out on us even two years later. So, because uh, they didn't get to do it the following year quite like they wanted to. And so then, man, they really gave it to us that one year. Bama's probably the, the, the biggest team that I watch out for for revenge games there ever will be. Uh, they're the most capable of getting revenge whenever they have gotten beaten. And that was a big one last year. So what, um, what are some things that you need to look out for when, uh, when you're going to be watching this game? It's the sixth game of the year. Things are liable to change. So remember these names, but they could, they, they could be different. Burroughs, big guy, huge guy on the defensive line. Will Anderson at linebacker. This is the guy that was going up against, I believe, Fathery this last year, who did an excellent job on him. I watched their spring game. The spring game was very interesting. You'd almost say it was like ours to a degree because we, we got a lot of flack for this when we were talking about, well, the completions by the QBs weren't so good. And we said, well, it was a windy day. And it was. It was legitimately a windy day. Bama's spring game was wet and it was kind of... It wasn't full on sloppy, but it, it wasn't pretty. Um, so you had you had a few wet footballs, but the game the game looked sloppy. Um, I don't want to make bulletin board material. I just want to call it as it is. But I wasn't impressed by the spring game. So take that for what you will. But whenever I look through things, you know, Bryce Anderson. I'm sorry, Bryce Young was not accurate. Um, Jojo Earl had quite a few drops. Whenever I watched Jameer Gibbs run the ball, it looked like it was different to me than what the rest were doing. Jameer Gibbs is a uh, running back transfer from Georgia Tech, if you didn't know. When he ran the ball, he ran with purpose, and I was not really seeing the same purpose out of the rest. So that just, you know, it just kind of gets me wondering. It's just something to think about. The line on this game, I think, is right around 16 or 17 at this moment. Uh, in Bama's favor, um, can we cover that again this year? And again, that's at, this is going to be at their place. Can we cover that? Uh, I'm not probably going to sit here and tell you, yeah, I think we can cover that. Um, I mean, yeah, do more than cover it. I mean, like last year we, we, we were the dog, and we would have won if you had bet us on the money line, okay? So can we cover the spread? Yes, we can cover the spread. That's actually my prediction probably for this game. I, I think we're probably going to take the L on this one. We are very capable of winning this game. And, and, and watch out. I would put Alabama on upset alert for this game. Don't get me wrong. But I see this game as being close. They'll probably maybe pull it out in the end. They're at home. They've got one of the best defenses they've probably or likely to have had this 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 coming year which is going to make it very tough it's a good year for us to have an uh, a better offense but um they have their ways about going to make making offenses look pedestrian so if we struggle to put up more than about 20 points it's going to be a very difficult game to win and that looks like that's um shaping up to be the case so i think um we keep this game close we end up losing but watch out Watch out. This is definitely an upset game. I'm going to be looking into seeing when's the last time that Alabama lost two in a row to the same team. Hopefully it's to us, but the spring game gives me pause for concern. Just saying. We'll see how things play out. Maybe want to look at those first two games again that we play and just see how dialed in we are. Maybe uh, when we play uh, Miami, we, we route them pretty good. Okay, now we're starting to talk. Maybe we take care of business handily with Arkansas and Mississippi State and, and, and make it look like it was, you know, just a, a hand ride if I'm, you know, watching a secretariat, you know, run at the, uh, at the Belmont Stakes uh, and winning by, what, I don't know, 14 links. So do you doing something like that? You can, you can just go and up the bar for upset alert, okay? So I'm going to leave you right there because we'd be here all night trying to dissect all these games. But hopefully you got some good nuggets out of this so that you can kind of have an idea about you know where you think things are going to fall right now i have us at five and one after bama week we're going to get a buy after that 
and then we're going to go to South Carolina. Uh, we're going to have Ole Miss and Florida at home. Florida again. Auburn, we're going to play UMass, um, and then LSU. So we'll get to those games next week. Cause